Good morning, Bill Baessa and Dominique Saxa. As NBC uh, ends its coverage, we begin ours, continuing it, the final farewell for President George H.W. Bush. You're looking right now at the train uh, up in spring that will take the president and his entire family to College Station. As network coverage was leaving us, they were showing people departing from St. Martin's Church here in Houston, and the presidential motorcade is now heading down Memorial Park, and I know our Joel Eisenbaum is stationed there to cover the procession route. Joel? Dominique, we are. We're at the corner of Memorial Drive and South Picnic Lane. This is really the heart of Memorial Park, and I'm told this will be a very similar, if not exact same route as was done several months ago for Barbara Bush. And you can see what I believe is a state trooper's Tahoe coming down the road. The entire procession, which is for the family principally, to get from St. Martin's Episcopal Church to the train depot as the crow flies. That's about a 28 mile trip. They're taking somewhat of a scenic route. And part of the reason for that, I understand, is because the Bush family adores this park. In fact, in his younger years, President George H.W. Bush used to run at this park. He wouldn't run the stretch that was along Memorial Drive, but his detail, Secret Service agents, would allow him essentially to run the interior parts of the park. And so he had a deep connection to Memorial Park, certainly one of the hallmarks of Houston and we can see what is the uh, very first vehicle is just passing me right here that is a state troopers vehicle it is a procession which will continue uh, eastbound on Memorial Drive uh, until the Westcott area and then they'll hang a left I understand and make their way eventually down the uh, Hardy Toll Road into spring to the Union Pacific train depot uh, of course with President uh, George H.W. Bush aboard we saw a couple police cars sort of slow rolling through here uh, just a few minutes ago. I don't see any cars following. I think we have a very good vantage point from this spot at the corner of Memorial Drive and South Picnic Lane. But keep in mind, this is essentially over six plus days we've seen planes trains and automobiles uh, used uh, in these ceremonies this is what i believe is essentially the last uh, motorcade by automobile for the president as he will uh, board that very special train about 28 miles from here uh, in about 45 to 50 minutes as I understand it but this is a route where uh, several people and it wasn't well publicized but that the public is gathering along Memorial Drive here and with that of course you have HPD doing some measure of crowd control they've got uh, and I'm getting a signal that way far down in the distance yeah that's right you can see that the motorcade is now coming uh, eastbound, that would be inbound towards downtown from, they had just crossed the West Loop. Joel, can you give us an idea as to how many people are gathered there? Oh, there's certainly a few hundred, which to me is somewhat amazing because um, I didn't see anywhere where this was publicized uh, information of this was uh, well publicized, at least, as a spot to gather. So these are people, uh, I've met several veterans here this morning, and let me just take a moment to uh, take this in with everybody else as this motorcade gets ready to pass us. Houston police vehicles were leading the pack there with special 41 stickers on their windshield. Uh, some dignitaries are in this line, I understand, as well as uh, the higher-ups with the Houston Police Department. And a moment of silence as the hearse passes me. is uh, out of my view at least but there is still a long line of cars and trucks that are trailing behind it including buses these are family members uh, security details uh, and I understand a uh, smattering of folks who were uh, connected to the bushes uh, closely and then behind that they've got boy just all manner of emergency vehicles following up 
right behind the president. I understand that they're going to be on Memorial Drive heading eastbound, what is, to me, at least a mile-long procession of vehicles, uh, and then hang a left uh, before they get to the Shepherd area and then cut on to the highway and eventually make it up the Hardy Toll Road. It's uh, spring is their next destination, of course, to get on the train, Dominique. Joel, as you uh, have been reporting on the motorcade passing by there, it, it came to my mind suddenly that back in the 1970s, uh, there was a place called Otto's Barbecue, just as you enter the park in the direction that they're uh, moving here. And I remember seeing uh, Bush 41 at Otto's Barbecue. That was one of their favorite spots. It was the restaurant, the barbecue part, and then in the front of it was like a hamburger joint, beer joint. And he liked to sit up there and drink a beer from time to time with his, uh, with his old cronies. I actually caught the tail end of Otto's Barbecue. I remember that. I did not know that was one of President Bush's favorite spots, but I, I, I recall the place as well. I think it's uh, since disappeared, but You're I right. think this area, I mean, this entire area, as I understand it, was pretty special to the Bush family. It was indeed. As you noted earlier, this is the same route that uh, Barbara Bush took on her way uh, to College Station going by Memorial Park. Did you talk to any folks exact there? Exact same can route you as I understand it. Can you give us a sense of uh, what folks were saying that you talked to this morning? Yeah, I mean, the essential question that I was asking, Bill, is, uh, you know, why? Why did you come out here? Why did you take time out of your day to come to this spot specifically? And they said, look, this is the time that I chose to pay my respects, um, and this is how I wanted to do it. I wanted to watch him go by. I wanted to have that memory. And one of the women I talked to, was actually a retired lieutenant colonel in the Army, told me uh, I served under him. He was my commander in chief. Uh, this is the very least I can do is take time out of my work day uh, and come here and, and salute him as he makes his way uh, home, so to speak. That's right. Beautiful, and Joel, beautiful sentiment. You know, in the same the same sentiment was echoed by those who were there at Second Baptist Church at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning, waiting for shuttle buses, still even an hour-plus delay at that time, just to make it over to St. Martin's to be able to pay their respects there in the wee hours of the morning. It's that same sense of attachment. I mean, this entire week, we've seen people making every sort of effort, I think, to pay their respects. Uh, to President George H.W. Bush. I mean, people who are stopping what they are doing to take time out of their days and lives to make sure they pay uh, respect to him properly in their minds. Joel Eisenbaum, thank you so much for giving us our first look at the motorcade as it uh, proceeds from here to spring. Uh, and the train station. So at this point, that motorcade is now on Memorial Drive, getting closer into downtown. And we heard that they'll be taking the Hardy Toll Road, but first there's some negotiation through town. So for that, we've got our Jennifer Reyna standing by to talk about some traffic. Awful lot of traffic out there today, Jen. Yeah, thank you. Looking at the lunch hour rush, right? So I got a lot of emails from folks asking, okay, what's gonna be blocked? Is it gonna be 45? Well, you know, the route specifically was not released to the public for safety reasons. But what I can remind you about, St. Martin's Episcopal Church, those closures lasting until one right near the church. So those of you in Tanglewood, for the duration of this time period, you should still take the alternate routes like Memorial Drive, San Felipe, and Westheimer, and plan a little bit more time into your route if you need to be in this area because we still have Woodway shut down between North Post Oak uh, out to Chimney Rock. So that means more traffic spills onto surrounding streets. So you heard that the motorcade passed right through Memorial Park. They'll make their way, continue down Memorial Drive until they need to cut over to I-10 and work their way up to 45, the North Freeway. I just checked some camera shots. Traffic is still moving along 45, making their way toward the Hardy Toll Road and then shooting north toward the Spring area. By the way, this is a fall sensor, so there are no slowdowns on the Hardy Toll Road right before the Beltway. As you would imagine, uh, Houston Police Department will clear any roadway conditions uh, that are in the way anyway. So that reminder of the closures near the church that will still affect drivers. Sage is still closed between Woodway and Tangle Lane. Riverway is still closed between Sage and South Post Oak, and those closures will reopen by 1 p.m. today. That final destination for former George H.W. Bush starts in spring, and then the train shall take him through several cities up through the College Station area, and uh, you are advised to stay 25 feet away from the train as you pay your last respects. Guys? All right, Jennifer, thank you. We will be able to give you an aerial view of the uh, 
motorcade as it makes its way up to the train. There is an airspace restriction right now, so our Sky 2 helicopter can't bring you that video. But in about 10 minutes from now, we will be able to do that. Meantime, let's go back to the church, St. Martin's Episcopal, the focal point of today's service. As mourners are now departing, our Andy Sirota is standing by live. Andy, it was a beautiful ceremony. Absolutely beautiful, very touching ceremony, Dominique and Bill. I want to draw your attention to what's happening here behind me. You can see many of the guests, nearly a thousand guests attended today's funeral service. It was invite only. A couple of faces that I can spot out here in the crowd. Uh, Dikende Mutombo, Yao Ming, actor Chuck Norris also here uh, waiting in line to board one of these buses back to Second Baptist Church. Basically, here's how it worked today. If you lived west of the Mississippi and you were a friend or a former staff member of Mr. Bush's, then you got an invitation to be here to honor and celebrate a life well lived. The tone of today's service, very different from the one that we saw yesterday during the state funeral in Washington, D.C. Former Secretary of State James Baker delivering the eulogy this morning. A friend of the late president for 60 years, he characterized their relationship more like big brother, little brother. He said the president was never someone who liked to brag. And Mr. Baker jokingly started with an apology saying that's exactly what he was going to do today. Brag on his dear friend and all that he accomplished in his life. He said that Bush 41 became one of our nation's finest presidents and our nation's best one-term president. The world became a better place because George Bush occupied the White House for four years. He was not considered a skilled speaker, but his deeds were quite eloquent. They expressed his moral character and they reflected his decency, his boundless kindness and consideration of others, his determination always to do the right thing and always to do that to the very best of his ability. And back live here now, you are looking at the guests getting ready to board the bus. I don't know if you can spot former Houston Mayor Bill White in the crowd. There's Chuck Norris. He just took a picture with some folks who were also standing in line. Bill Dominique, a powerful yet moving day as Houstonians and people from different parts of the country came here to honor and celebrate a life well lived, to honor and celebrate the life of a man who dedicated his life to public service. Guys, back to you. Andy, I think one special moment was hearing the rector talk about what kind of church members both President Bush and Barbara sure. Bush were, even commenting on how they would give up their seats if they saw a mother with children or giving the jacket off of his back if he felt somebody was cold. They were just that generous and unpretentious. Yeah, I mean, this church, St. Martin's Episcopal, was their home away from home. They worshiped here for about 50 years, the past 50 years. I mean, they were like family to so many of their fellow congregation members, and they knew them so well. I mean, they forged really special bonds and really special relationships with a lot of the people who've been attending church here for decades as well. And the rector of the church there, Russ Levinson, a very close friend of the Bushes. Andy, thank you so much for the, your, your beautiful um, recounting of today's and funeral service there at St. Martin's. Uh, the airspace restrictions have now been lifted from our helicopter, and so we're able to give you a view of the motorcade as it proceeds now to spring. Yes, uh, this is a Sky 2 aerial shot, and I'm going to lean over to Jennifer Reyna and see if she can give us an idea exactly as to where the hearse is. But I know it's going to make its one way. Of the bayous there. Yes, it's going to make its way onto the Hardy Toll Road, um, not that far from now. So they theoretically could be on 45 heading north to cut over to 610, but we'll get verification on that. But it's a very uh, slow crawl uh, today. Uh, traffic obviously much lighter than yesterday because we are now around London time as opposed to yesterday's drive from Ellington Field into uh, the church area which happened during rush hour so Dominique this is uh, still on Memorial Drive heading into town approaching downtown Houston uh, if you are familiar they have already passed Wall Drive they are coming up to the I-45 uh, split there off of Memorial Drive you, you gave us a mileage uh, a while ago of uh, the motorcade from here to spring should take about what 25 30 minutes 
Correct, just about. And the, and the freeways obviously are going to be clear. So it's going to take about a half an hour. It looks like they are going at about 30 miles per hour or so. So from what I can tell, uh, let's see if they're going to take that exit. Okay, if they were to have taken that exit, that gets you into downtown right by the police station and where 45 would connect to West Dallas. So it's, they are continuing to travel inbound or eastbound on Memorial Drive. And Jen, it looks like if they keep this pace, then they'll be arriving a little bit later than expected to the uh, train station there. Like you mentioned, they're going 35. We don't know if they will uh, speed things up once they get on the freeway. I think that's a deliberate speed just mm -hmm. so that folks can see the motorcade coming by. And you, eventually, as we continue to look at aerials, we'll see people pulling over out of respect uh, for this motorcade as it passes. I also want to give you a heads up that we will be able to give you an aerial view of the entire route from Houston to College Station. We'll be able to follow it in our helicopter. So from time to time as we do uh, stops in these towns with our reporters who are stationed there, we'll also be able to give you an aerial view. So Andy was talking. Is, Go ahead, Jen, I'm sorry. No, you can see this is right by uh, our downtown aquarium. Uh, that's where the Ferris wheel is. This is Bagby here. Right, at Bayou Place, that's right. right. We'll be climbing up on the freeway here mm -hmm. in a second. Uh, Andy was telling us, uh, a while ago that many of the uh, celebrities and, and other guests who were invited, and I understand there were up to a thousand people invited, are still at St. Martin's waiting for the Metro shuttle to take them back to uh, Second Baptist. Yes, Second Baptist Church. Our Haley Hernandez has been stationed there, and I'm not quite sure if she's ready to talk to us yet, but let's uh, give it a go. Haley, are you available? Hey guys, I'm, I am here right now and we are waiting on the buses to come over here as Andy was mentioning. Now the church that they're coming from is uh, down the street so it's taking them a little while. None of the buses have showed up yet but as Andy was mentioning we believe that on the first bus we have people like uh, Houston icons like Yao Ming, uh, actor Chuck Norris. I do have the list with me of people that were notable people that were in attendance today. We've got people such as um, as I mentioned, Chuck Norris, we've got Nolan Ryan, Craig Biggio, J.J. Watt. These are some people that we do expect to run into today. I know that our Roseanne Aragon spoke to Arnold Schwarzenegger earlier um, and uh, Brandon Walker, who was here and handed off to me, said he spoke to um, some other people that were in Bush's cabinet. I'm looking at other names as I'm talking to you right now. Um, Tillman Fertitta and uh, Mattress Mac. These are all people uh, of notable of notoriety that we do expect to be coming off of the buses. But as I mentioned, none of the buses have come through yet. I'm looking over my shoulder, hoping to get you somebody, but nobody's here at this moment. So I will keep um, keep a watch out and join you guys back here in a little while. All right, Haley, when the buses start to arrive, we'll come back to you so that we can uh, hear what some of the folks had to say about the service today. Yeah. We're back up at the motorcade now uh, as it moves through downtown on its way to, um, to Spring, to the Union Pacific uh, rail yard there where the uh, train 4141 awaits the president. So, Jen, based on what we're seeing here, does it look like they're going to pick up on I-45, or can you tell? Well... <sighs> I think that's about the uh, the only route they can take. You know, f to get up to the Hardy Toll Road, they could take side streets. Um, sure, and they're going south on Smith Street right now. I mean, you can work your way over to Maine. You could go up Fulton. Right. Um, you know, there are several ways to get up there, but I... As you mentioned, uh, the, the route was not uh, announced in advance because uh, the Secret Service doesn't like folks to know whether they're going to be exactly. taking. And, of course, Bush 43 is in this motorcade as well. So you'll learn as we learn, and uh, we'll just keep our bird high above, and that way we can see the rights and lefts of this uh, presidential motorcade heading up to the Union Pacific Rail Car 4141. And that will also be a very interest interesting and beautiful part of this story as well. So it looks like they are going to take 45 the North Freeway because they have halted some traffic as they approach the highway. There you go. I'm looking at 45 equipment and police are getting in position right now and the last of those vehicles are able to get through as they halt traffic. So they'll take 45 the North Freeway northbound until they get to the North Loop. Then they'll take that eastbound just to cut over to the Hardy Toll Road. As I mentioned, we do have reporters on station at the various uh, towns along the route. We're going to cover at least three of these towns, mm -hmm. and our coverage will begin uh, when the motorcade arrives at the Westfield train station. 
Uh, eventually they will arrive at College Station? Yes, they will, and, and you see all the stops along the way where people will have an opportunity to bid farewell to the former president. Our Jonathan Martinez live in College Station, and he'll be covering that aspect of our coverage. Jonathan? Yeah, Bill and Dominique, right now things are pretty quiet out here, but we certainly are anxiously awaiting the arrival of the 41st president. Of course, that will not be happening for several hours until now. Uh, he will be getting on board that 4141 locomotive, making his way through several of the small towns. And as you mentioned, we have crews scattered throughout uh, all of those cities to bring that coverage to you live. Uh, but once they get here, there will be a ceremony where that locomotive stops. It's going to be on the other side of uh, Bluebell Park, not too far away from Caulfield. There is a stage, a set of risers set up there where some four or five 500 people, VIP guests, dignitaries, students, and many more will be there to greet the president as he gets here. We're told after that his casket will be removed from the locomotive. There will be a small procession in comparison to Barbara Bush's procession. It'll make its way down George Bush Drive, finally up uh, Barbara Bush Drive here, and it'll finally arrive here to the roundabouts uh, where more ceremonies are planned. That will include a 21 aircraft flyover. We're being told that one of those aircrafts will also perform that missing man maneuver as well. We're told uh, when they do arrive, here. There will be some 1,600 uh, A&M Corps cadets that will be welcoming uh, the president, just as they did for Barbara Bush. Uh, and pretty much every branch of the military will be out here to pay honor and their respect to the former first president as he is being prepared to be laid to rest alongside the love of his life, Barbara, and his daughter, Robin, as well. So we, of course, will be out here. But that right now is, again, it's quiet, but we are anxiously awaiting for the president to get here. Hello, Dominique. All right, Jonathan, thank you. This journey, of course, replicates one that was taken a little less than eight months ago when uh, Barbara Bush was taken to the uh, Presidential Library in College Station uh, and laid to rest next to their daughter, Robin. The hearse is at the center of your screen as Sky 2 is capturing the move from St. Martin's Church up to the train station, the Union Pacific Railroad, and uh, quite the journey it is. Uh, a plane ride yesterday, a train ride today, and, uh, and Jen was saying that they're making their way up to I-45. They'll then cut over to 610, head east, and then take the Hardy Toll Road north. Is that right? Yes, exactly. Their position right now is North Freeway, northbound, just past Franklin, so they are barely making their way out of downtown Houston. We have captured the uh, line of vehicles here following the hearse with our Houston Transtar camera and with Chopper. Uh, so right now they are headed in the northbound direction. It will take them about six minutes or so to get to the north loop as they cut over eastbound. Right, so they're on northbound 45 now heading to the Westfield train station in spring. Uh, this is the first time that a president will be taken to his final resting place by train since President Dwight Eisenhower. And the reason this is happening is because of the president's love for trains. He wasn't a person who collected uh, model railroad trains or anything of that sort, but his dad had been involved with Union Pacific and he knew people along the way. And interestingly enough, back in 19, I think it was 1994, when they broke ground on the presidential library in College Station, uh, the Bushes were trying to figure out how they were gonna get all the friends and dignitaries uh, who were going to be there for the groundbreaking, how they were going to get them from Houston to College Station. So uh, Bush 41 called in a favor from some of his uh, dad's um, friends at the railroad, and uh, right quick they sent a train uh, down to Houston and took uh, the Bushes and all their uh, entourage for the groundbreaking at the museum to College Station by train. So this is actually the second time uh, that the family will have uh, taken a train to College Station. And the train that we'll see today, 4141, is custom painted. Uh, they're using the colors and the elements from Air Force One during uh, Bush's 41st presidency. Uh, this train car is normally stored in Arkansas. It's been out of regular service for the last few years. Uh, in all, the train will have about 10 to 11 cars, some of which will be carrying the Bush family as well. So as we, as we anticipate that next part of our coverage here, we want to go back to the church because as we last saw with Andy Sirota, many of the congregants are coming out and they're all waiting for buses to be taken back to Second Baptist Church. And Andy, I understand that you have Police Chief Art Acevedo with you. Dominique, that's right. You know, you mentioned notable figures attending today's invitation-only funeral for former President George H.W. Bush. 
among the guests, Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo. Thanks for being here with us this afternoon. We've talked a lot about how the tone of today's service was a lot different than what we saw during the state funeral in Washington, D.C. How would you describe the mood and the atmosphere in there this morning during the service? Well, I think it's no matter where you were at, it's a celebration. And uh, it was people taking time out to to know to, to actually celebrate the life of a man who everybody knew everybody loved but most importantly made a tremendous impact not just on houston and texas but on our nation he made a lifelong commitment to public service for you what was the most poignant moment in there today i think for me watching the casket leave uh, for the last time knowing that our president has been such a uh, a big part of houston that for the last time he left this church for the last time. We saw him go by and we did the wall of honor. And uh, uh, it's just, a, he's really truly the last of the Mohicans, right? Uh, just a very uh, great man that will, they don't make him like him anymore. So it was uh, a sad moment and bittersweet. The last of the greatest generation. One of the th one of the things that stuck out to me, we saw a lot of the different uh, officers on motorcycle, and they all had the number 41. Yeah. You want to tell us about that? You know, yeah. So last night, I actually got a, uh, one of my motor sergeants came up to me. Uh, actually, the lieutenant came up to me and said, hey, look at what somebody made us. We'd like to uh, put them on the bikes. And I said, absolutely. I, it was interesting they would ask for authorization because, to me, that's a no-brainer. To honor a man that meant so much to this city and this uh, state and nation is uh, something that uh, is, 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 you, don't, you don't hesitate to honor him. Can you tell us a little bit about the role that HPD will pl be playing this afternoon in the procession? Well, we, you know, our job is to get him, uh, help get him safely to the train, and uh, and that's what we've done uh, for the last couple of days. And it's something that our people will take with them to uh, to their graves. But to take time to honor a man and his family that uh, did so much for our nation is something that will be the highlight of a lot of careers here today. He's a politician and a true gentleman. I don't, I, I, don't, I don't think he was a politician. If he was a politician, he probably would have uh, gotten a second term. Uh, I think he's a man that put country first and not necessarily his own interest, and I think that's what made him special. Houston Police Chief Art Acevedo, appreciate your insights this afternoon, you. sir. Thank you so right. much. It's starting to rain out here, but, uh, you know, that's what we expect, what we're expecting today. I've got another guest here that I'd like to bring in right now. Mr. Jim Mattress Mac McInvale, I'm going to step over to this side and get you right over here. Great to see you. Great to be here. How you feeling? Very uplifted after uh, President Bush's uh, funeral service here. Just an incredible man, a great Houstonian, great Texan, great American, and somebody we can all try to live up to. And I asked this question of the chief, and I want to ask it to you. Uh, the tone today here, obviously very different than what it was in Washington, D.C. during the state funeral yesterday. What struck you most about today's service? What was the mood like in there? I think the mood was very, you know, we're all sad because the great man is gone and it's left a, a, certainly a hole in the world in Houston, but we're also all inspired by his incredible life. Such a great human being, he and Mrs. Bush both, and he just set a standard, a, a role model for all of us to try to live up to what he does. You two were friends. Share with us if you don't mind, your fondest memory of Mr. Bush. Well, my wife told me last night about one time there was a, a Rockets uh, fundraiser, and she was talking with President Bush, and I was too, and my little daughter Elizabeth came up. She was about six years old, and uh, she says, Dad, can I go buy this auction item? And uh, she, her mother said, Elizabeth, you're interrupting. Do you know who you're interrupting? She says, duh, yeah, Mom, can I go get the money? And then <laughs> President Bush said, that's a smart kid, but millions of great memories. Uh, the biggest thing was... He always treated everybody so well, whether it was the valet park guy or the waiter or the million-dollar donor. He treated everybody the same, a great American, a great Houstonian. And you two share something very important in common. You both give back to the community. He cared deeply about the Houston community and the people that he came in contact with, many of whom he called friends. Yeah, whatever I asked Mrs. Bush or President Bush to do, they always right there. I asked them about the uh, tsunami thing. They put together the Bush Clinton tsunami thing. We raised $15 million for that. So he was always there, always said yes. And as far as public service, he's definitely my role model. As far as being a gracious human being, you couldn't get a better role model than him. As far as how to live a life worth living, he's the best. People were so taken by his grace and his virtue and his decency. What will you miss most about him? All of those things. Just 
you know, just him being there inspired all of us in Houston. And, and uh, you know, seeing him at the Astros game or the Texans game or whatever, he was George Bush. He was the 41st president of the United States. But at the same time, he was one of us. He loved his sports teams, didn't he? And he loved this town. He loved the people. And, uh, of course, as they said in there, he loved his family and his faith. So just the type of person that we all should aspire to be. Appreciate your insight this afternoon. Jim Thank Mattress, Mac Mackinville. Thank you so much for being here. Andy, let me ask you, uh, we see the Metro buses behind you there. Have they finally begun shuttling people back to Second Baptist, the Woodway campus? Looks like it's just yeah, Bill, now they're beginning. They're starting to get uh, folks sent back to Second Baptist Church. Uh, as I said, it's beginning to rain here. The rain's coming down at a pretty good clip now. But yeah, these buses, these Metro buses are now on their way back to Second Baptist Church. And, and we've been told that once those buses arrive, that uh, our crews who are there will have a better chance at, at getting more interviews with a lot of these guests. That is, if they're willing to talk to the media to share their thoughts about today's beautiful service. Well, so you're, far you're right, us. Andy. We do have Haley Hernandez there at Second Baptist. Yes, so and we will be talking to. Her. We've loved the interviews you've given us so far. It's just wonderful insight as to the level of appreciation that everybody has for the former president. So if you find somebody else, let us know, and we'll come back to you. Okay, Andy. Guys, will be here. All right, sure. Andy. Andy Sirota there at St. Martin's. We're back up now with the motorcade, I believe, on the Hardy Toll Road, road now, Dominique. That's right, Hardy Toll Road heading northbound. And, you know, it's ironic. There's a, uh, a train track that parallels the Hardy Toll Road in just a little bit. And that's exactly where this hearse and motorcade is headed to the Westfield train station for that final ride via rail into College Station as Sky 2 remains perched above to show you the slow speed drive roughly they were doing 35 miles in town uh, they've picked it up a little bit but still not moving along too quickly taking their time going through Houston on a uh, somewhat drizzly day here in town we've had beautiful weather thus far and it's going to be another exceptional ride into College Station giving yet other people who do not have maybe access to come into Houston or to have been a part of the beautiful ceremony today, it gives them a chance to bid farewell to our 41st president along. And, and they're not stops, but they're towns that the train is going to go through. And so from what we've seen from our coverage over the past couple of days, those towns, Navasota, they're all preparing for large numbers of crowds to be there at the ready just to wave goodbye. In Old Town Spring, uh, where all those beautiful little shops are, yes. all the people we talked to there yesterday were really looking forward to this because they have a perfect view of the train and when it uh, heads off. Uh, Robert Arnold mm -hmm. has uh, uh, been waiting for the motorcade to arrive. He is at the Westfield train station in Spring. Robert? Yes, we're starting to see a lot more activity. Members of the military, the ceremonial troops starting to get in position, get things ready as that motorcade approaches. And there it is right there. There is Bush 4141. This is the train that will carry the president from Houston to College Station. As you've been mentioning, it's about a 70 mile trip, about two and a half hours long. I want to talk about 4141 a little bit. This was a rather unique honor for the president. Union Pacific officials tell us this is the only the sixth time in the company's history that a locomotive has been painted a color different than traditional yellow and red colors. They also shared with us a story that when this was commissioned in 2005, the president was so excited when he was on board, he actually asked if he could drive for a little bit. Well, the Union Pacific people were very gracious and they let him sit in the engineer's chair, gave him a quick crash course, and with the engineer right over his shoulder, they say that the president did take the controls for about two miles and just loved every second of it. As you've been mentioning, that color scheme on the locomotive is is meant to resemble Air Force One. Even the back of it, if you look at the way it's designed, it also resembles the aircraft. You even have the American flag there uh, on the back. And one of the other things that you had been talking about, Bill, this is a really rather unique moment in history as well. This will be the first time this century a president has been carried to his final resting place by train. You had said President Eisenhower in 1969, he was the last president to be carried by rail. He was taken all the way from Washington, D.C. to Abilene, Kansas where he was laid to rest. Now, the way this is all going to happen is when the motorcade arrives, it will come through here, and then you will have the ceremonial troops. They will take up places. Members of the Bush family will be escorted to their positions. Then after that, they will remove the president's casket. At that, uh, pro at that point, you will have the presentation of arms as well as musical honors. After that is done, then the president's casket will be taken into that car 
right in front of us. That's the one with the American flag on it. We placed inside. Members of the Bush family will then be escorted onto the train, and then the train will make its final journey. Now, we are hearing some sirens, so we know that that motorcade may be getting close to the area. As soon as that happens, though, we have been asked to all stop speaking as that ceremony takes place through here. But again, once the motorcade arrives, you will have the military take up positions here, and again, they will have the musical honors and the presentation of arms with the family before the president's uh, casket is taken on board the train. Again, about a 70-mile trek between Houston and College Station. It should take about two and a half hours, pass through about eight towns between Houston and College Station through this area. And so just as soon as that motorcade arrives, that ceremony will begin. I know there had been uh, a little bit of consternation that it's been raining out here, that it started raining, but we've seen all the different ceremonial troops getting their gear ready, getting everything in position to start this ceremony before the president is taken to College Station. Bill Dominique. Robert, the uh, the engine, the 4141 engine, had been uh, in storage since 2012, awaiting this day. Yes, it has. But, you know, before that, this was not just for show. This was an actual working locomotive. It had hauled goods in about the, in, in the, all, throughout the 22 states that the Union Pacific Rail Lines served. So before uh, 2012, this was actually a working locomotive, Bill, and it's done a lot of work, according to Union Pacific. And today it does its most important uh, work of its life, taking the absolutely, president to, uh, to, to the final stop. One other thing, Robert, uh, I don't know if you, you read about this, but uh, Bush 41, uh, during 1992, when he was uh, seeking re-election to a second term, did some whistle-stop tours on a train through the Southeast and the Midwest. <laughs> yes, he did. He's always, ever since what we've heard, ever since childhood, he's always loved trains, been very fascinated with trains. And so this was something that had been talked about when these plans were being made. And it was something they really, it was a little bit of consternation back and forth about using, uh, about using the train, security, things like that. But the family and, of course, President Bush, really, this was something they wanted because he's always had a great love of trains. And yes, that's why he did use the whistle stop in that. He feels it's a good way to connect with people and Plus, he gets to experience one of the things that he really enjoyed in life as well, Bill. Robert, talk, talk about the specific rail car that the president will be in. This is not your typical rail car in the way that it's outfitted, as well as family, because they'll be riding in the train as well. It's a baggage car, essentially, <laughs> right? Yes, yes, it is. And if I'll get out of the way so you can see it straight there. You do have the passenger cars here for the family members and uh, other close friends of the family. But the car that the casket is going to be in, you notice how it's much more open. And you see there's that clear square there. It's plexiglass. That's so as it goes along the route, all the people who have lined up along the route can catch a glimpse of the president's coffin as it makes its way to College Station. So it's outfitted differently so people who are along the uh, along the rail line do get a glimpse of the casket as it makes its way to College Station. That's the difference, and it's much more open. Robert, I can't read it, but to the to the right of the American flag, there's yellow, and then there's writing there. Can you tell us what that says? Yes, it says proud heritage, powerful future, building America. I believe that's the the, the Union standard Pacific. Union Pacific. Yes, 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 it is. Robert, the, uh, the motorcade will reach you in about 15 minutes, and when it does, we will come back to you. Thank you so much, Robert Arnold, uh, at Excellent. the Westfield train station in Spring, where the uh, the president will be loaded on board the train for his uh, final journey to his resting place. Uh, where are we now here, Dominique? Well, it's uh, Hardy Tall Road. There was just an overpass, and I'm not sure if we're close to the Beltway. I'm gonna rely on Jennifer to give us some logistics there. Yes, they are closer to about 10 minutes away from where you just saw Robert Arnold. We are looking at uh, Hardy Toll Road and Walston, just passing up the Aldine area, right at the Hardy Toll Road North Beltway interchange. Okay. All right, Jennifer, thanks so much. By the way, these uh, Metro bus shuttles from St. Martin's to, uh, to, to to the Woodway campus of Second Baptist have finally begun to arrive. They are, and Haley Hernandez has been standing by. She said she'd get back to us when people started arriviving. I'm guessing you've got somebody, Haley. Republican senator from 61, uh, okay. to his two daughters. Are Haley, can you hear us? I don't think she realizes she's on the air yet. Haley, can you hear us? Good morning, guys. So yeah. I am talking to, oh, she's running away now. Um, <laughs> tell me what you thought about the service today. I thought it was beautiful and, and very fit. Remind me your name? I'm Penny Cook. Penny Tower Cook. Okay, and, and remind me of your relationship with Mr. Bush. Well, our father, John Tower, was elected to the Senate in 1961, 
Uh, and so he he was first Republican elected since Reconstruction. And so he and the Bushes and our families and the Bushes have been friends for years. Well, I know you're good family friends and you guys were giggling and carry on just now. So you must have had you must have taken away a, a lighthearted feeling of celebration. Well, the Bushes are just an amazing family and um, in a way, uh, I mean, as sad as it is, and it's so sad to lose them, but after Barbara died uh, this spring, it's just, I think it was, he's thrilled to be with her again. I think so, too. It, yeah. it made for a lovely love story, didn't it? it? Would you guys like to say something about the service today? Yes, it was beautiful, and we were just so appreciative to be a part of it, to send our love to the family and uh, to the president. You know, I keep we keep hearing the same uh, messages over and over again about what a caring and generous person he was. Is that what the message that you took away from today as well? Well, of course, I've, I've known Mr. Bush since the late 60s, and he's one of the finest men I ever, ever met. He's a role model for all of society and uh, uh, a great leader, and, and he's had an outpouring of support all over the world in the last 24 hours. This was a great send-off. This was a wonderful send-off. And being from Dallas, I have to say, the people from Houston have been absolutely amazing. Everyone we've met, and it was from dawn this morning, <laughs> very friendly, very accommodating, and very loving. Mr. Bush would have been really proud of his city today. I think so. Thank you. And thank you for putting that on record. Well, <laughs> I forgot. My husband was on George, yes. George H.W.'s first congressional staff, 66. Will you tell me your name, sir? Uh, John De La Garza. Mr. De La Garza, uh, what, did, uh, what was your relationship with Mr. Bush like? I was on his legislative, uh, legislative assistant for him and his first House staff back in 66 and 67, a long, long time ago. <laughs> and what are your favorite memories of him? Uh, the kind, kind guy, uh, great sense of humor. He and Barbara were just a wonderful couple. They were a men they've been a mentor to us for many years. We've kept up with them, and uh, we just are very fond of them. It's a, it's a remarkable, remarkable love affair that George had with both his family and his wife and his country, and with his staff for that matter. Good to hear. And you took that message uh, away from the ceremony as well. You think that was a good? Um... I've I've watched everything yesterday and been luckily to have been invited today. Yes, it it caught it caught the character of the man and the character of the family. Uh, we hope someday it can be duplicated. It's tough right now, but we'll get there. Sure thing. Thank you very much. I appreciate you speaking with welcome. me. All right, Bill and Jomini, stick with me one minute. We're going to see if we can find somebody else. As you're looking, uh, I, what he just said really resonates yeah. because I read an op-ed in the Chronicle uh, yesterday talking about how uh, the president hadn't even been buried yet, but yet people on both the left and the right are using the opportunity to continue to bash what's happening in the White House. They're saying, can we at least have one or two days here of kinder and gentler? And Bill, just to give everybody their parameters, I just saw the airport signs on the street. So the airport exit is right there off of the Hardy Toll Road. So they'll be approaching Greens Road shortly. Uh, just to give you an idea, a few minutes ago, they were nine miles away. So they're probably closing in on eight or seven and a half miles. Haley has another guest right now, Dominique, I'm okay. being told. Thank you as well. Go ahead, Haley. Tell me about your relationship with Mr. Bush. Well, it goes back a long ways. Uh, uh, when he was running for president, before he became the vice presidential candidate, uh, I worked in his campaign here in Houston. And tell me, what are what are some of your memories like with him? What are some of the stories that you can share with us? Well, many of the stories are kind of... <laughs> but one of the most fun stories was uh, he invited me to Camp Buckport. And uh, as I was leaving, he walked me to the car. And he said, uh, well, Rod, I got some really serious decision to make. I said, really, Mr. President, what is it? He said, I got to decide on whether I'm going to go in my boat or whether I'm going to go fishing. I said, Mr. President, you've got a history of making great decisions, so I'm sure you won't be having trouble with that one. Experience when um, um, Ronald Reagan uh, appointed him for his um, vice president. Oh. I was in the room with him when he got the telephone call from President Reagan. At that time, candidate Reagan to join him on the ticket to be the vice presidential candidate. 
That's a historical moment. It is a historical moment. It's one I've always treasured. What, what else can you tell me about that? What do you remember from that day? Well, I remember that he had just come from the convention center where he had just made his speech. And uh, we were all sad because the, the convention of thinking was it was going to be Ford. Ford was going to be the person that Reagan would take. But all of a sudden, something broke down with the discussion between Reagan and Ford, and, and Reagan made a, President Reagan made a different decision, and he called President Bush. Who was ambassador at the yeah, time. Yeah, it was ambassador Bush at that time, right. Yeah. And they were sitting in the suite, and um, it was pretty quiet, laid back, and then the phone call came through, and then everything changed. Secret Service came in and swooned in, and life was different from that point on. Were you too? Yes. Well, I liked reading about the story. We weren't married at the time. And did, she read my notes. I read his notes. He actually documented this in his diary. And oh, we um, he shared that diary with me, and we've been looking at that the last couple of days. So that was such a tremendous story. Fantastic. Well, thank you for sharing it with us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Have a lovely day. I appreciate thank you taking time to talk to me. Oh, you're quite welcome. That life kept you living. Very good. Thank you, guys. Haley Hernandez uh, at uh, Second Baptist looking for uh, more folks to interview who have been at the, uh, the service there. You can see the enormous media presence, media from all over the world here today, uh, many of whom stationed outside St. Martin's Church. They're also there at Second Baptist getting everybody coming back on buses and also a media presence up at the Westfield train station where our Robert Arnold... And you can see now the gathering of military members there. Uh, President this, and this color guard, Dominique, is, is, has come in from Washington. These are the, uh, the men and women who are trained to uh, conduct all the ceremonies, pro protocols for the, for the funerals, the inaugurations, all of these things. But there is a special group of folks here uh, who handle all the funerals at the Tomb of the Unknown and, and who handle the, the uh, coffins, the, uh, uh, the caskets of our heroes who are returning. They are a special squad. They're very strong. They're, they're chosen specifically for that because they're the only ones who hold the casket at shoulder height when they, uh, when they come in. I got this information from a lieutenant colonel who contacted me last night to tell me that he had been involved in the training of these folks in Washington. It's a private ceremony for the family only, no guests. We understand that uh, President and Mrs. Bush will be escorted by Major General Howard there. Um, we also understand honors will be rendered and the casket will be carried through the military cordon onto the train. And then the remains will be attended by a military vigil throughout the train movement. And we've shown you the map. We will continue to show you the map as the train makes its way to College Station. But it will be passing through the towns, Huffsmith, Pinehurst, Magnolia, Todd Mission, Stoneham, Navasota, Milliken, Welburn, and then into College Station. And so there are numerous crowds expected to gather at each of these towns for people to be able to bid their final farewell. Those living in this northwest section between Spring and College Station who are fortunate enough to see this rare opportunity, this beautiful moment of a special rail car carrying our 41st president. Uh, Robert Arnold is on the ground there at the, uh, at the uh, train station. And Robert, uh, we've seen a military presence for this former commander-in-chief uh, all along uh, from the very beginning of the funeral and his return here to houston he was a commander-in-chief so he rates this kind of uh, military honor but he's also a veteran who served with distinction and heroism in world war ii Absolutely, and trust me, that is on the thoughts of everybody's mind, and I'm going to have to stop talking. As soon as the motorcade comes in sight, we've all agreed to observe a moment of silence, and I believe the motorcade is here, so I'm going to let the pictures take over for now, Bill. All right, Robert.
we uh, know that silence is being enforced on the ground there at the uh, train station as the motorcade approaches, but we're told by Jennifer, who's been tracking its progress, that it's still a few minutes away. Uh, what we're looking at here is the, uh, the military honor guard. This is a inter-service honor guard representing all the services awaiting uh, the president so that they can load his casket on board the baggage car uh, that is part of this train. Our Robert Arnold is stationed there. He is the reporter covering this for you at Westfield train station, but all reporters must honor the silence request and we will continue to keep pictures up for you. These are live shots coming in now as we await the president's casket to be loaded onto this special rail, rail car that bears the American flag and a very large plexiglass window so that people along the train route will be able to see the president's casket. Uh, it's specially outfitted for the president. The rail car painted the colors of Air Force One in light blue, 4141. We've heard amazing stories, Robert, saying how the president was able to get behind the uh, the control, the control of this train, train and to, to drive this train for two minutes straight and like a kid in a candy store was so happy to be able to have that experience. Interestingly enough, presidential funerals are planned by the presidents themselves and it begins when they are in office. They are required as president to plan their own funerals while they're in office. He served one term, so in the four years that he served, he uh, planned this funeral, which in cor it, of course included this aspect of it, the train. He, uh, he knew that he'd be the first president uh, in modern times uh, to use a train as part of his funeral service because uh, Dwight Eisenhower, General Eisenhower, had been the, uh, the, the previous one. But keep in mind, these trains were Air Force One at one time. This is how presidents campaigned. It's how they traveled the country. Uh, and there was a special train that took the president around the country. And in homage to that, and I suppose just because he liked trains, the president, when he was uh, in office, planned this aspect of his funeral to be uh, one of the centerpieces so that en route to his presidential library or wherever he was going to be buried, because I don't think he had, he had decided just then, uh, he would be going through towns on a train. Essentially the bridge of the old and the new. Yes. And the rail representing the old days of America. And very few funerals took place on trains. President Lincoln, train carried his body through 180 cities and seven states. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Bobby Kennedy, and Bill, as you mentioned, President Dwight Eisenhower. And now we have President George Herbert Walker Bush awaiting his train here at the Westfield train station. We mentioned earlier that he campaigned uh, on a train through the Southeast and the Midwest when he was uh, seeking uh, his unsuccessful bid for a second term in office in 1992. And he made whistle stops in various towns. Also a nod to the past, Dominique, when, uh, when all presidents campaigned on train, they'd stop in a small town, uh, like Navasota, we're gonna go through here today, uh, stand on the back of the train, deliver their stump, peach, uh, stump speech from, the, from the, uh, the back of the train, the caboose, and then roll on to the next town. So he did that um, in Georgia. Uh, it was one, one of the states I remember seeing him do that. And it was, uh, it was remarkable to see that the past come, come to life, life in the, in the mm -hmm. 1990s. From what I understand from Jennifer Reyna, and you can see the large buses right there. So the motorcade is arriving and pulling into the parking lot there up in spring as they make their way to the Westfield train station. We've talked about how this is a private ceremony, no invited guests, military involved. And then it's going to be a roughly two hour, 25 minutes from this train station into Texas A&M. Of course, the, the, tr the trip could go a lot faster except for one thing. Uh, train tracks in Texas are notoriously bad. We have not restored our train tracks in many, many decades, uh, perhaps a century. And so trains, all freight trains and passenger trains, there is a train that goes from Houston to Los Angeles, travels very slowly. It takes almost five hours to get from here to San Antonio. So as the motorcade approaches here, Dominique, what do you say we, 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 we go silent as well here?
speed to get him.
VIP car. Hold on. So the ceremony transferring uh, the president's casket from the motorcade to the train has now been completed. The military has withdrawn. Reporters on the ground are still in an enforced silence until the train leaves the rail yard here on its journey uh, through several towns from Houston all the way to College Station. A ride, Dominique, I understand, is going to take about two and a half hours. That's what it's looking like. This is engine 4141 that you've been seeing as they pulled back the curtain and revealed the casket, the flag draped casket. As we watched this beautiful ceremony, there were a couple of images that really stood out to me. And as a photographer present, I'm sure these images were captured, but we saw the flag draped casket go by the Bush family in the drizzling rain, and everybody had their hands positioned on their hearts. And then as that casket made its way onto the train there was that last serviceman standing there in salute and it was just a beautiful touching image of honor and grace you saw that the uh, the pallbearers who uh, are trained to do just exactly what we saw uh, who come in from Washington are in that baggage car with the president's casket they will uh, ride all the way to its destination so that they can then offload the casket at College Station. And when we saw that funeral hearse arrive and the funeral director opened the back door and released the casket uh, from its moorings, that's the final time a civilian will touch uh, the commander in chief. The military takes over from here. And Bill, you were telling me as we were watching the live pictures of what was happening and you were talking about the Marines role. Can you elaborate on what took place? You saw that it was a joint service uh, casket guard. The, the, uh, the men who were, you saw how big they were. Mm -hmm. They all are much bigger than normal servicemen that you will see in the Marine Corps uh, or the Army, the Navy, uh, the Air Force, uh, because they bear a tremendous weight. And it, at some point in some ceremonies that we saw earlier, they lift that casket up to shoulder height so they train for it. They live in a special barracks where the, uh, where the uh, Tomb of the Unknown uh, is in Washington, D.C. They lift weights every day. They, uh, they maintain the strength that's needed to carry out this ceremony. They've come here uh, to carry it out here for Bush 41. They will uh, guard the casket until it arrives and carry it then uh, to its final resting place. And before they lifted, and you the asked me, I'm sorry, you asked me about the Marine. Right. The Marine, uh, the Marine Corps, uh, from a ceremonial aspect, is known for its handling of the American flag. Every Marine is taught uh, the reverence for the flag, all the ceremonial protocol for the flag, and how to fold the flag just a certain way. So before the casket was removed from the hearse, the Marine, who was the the, in, in that uh, casket guard, walked up to the, to the casket, uh, still in the hearse, and inspected the flag to make sure that, it, that in the trip from the church to here, that flag was still exactly as you see it here, the way it's supposed to be. And that has always been the Marine Corps' uh, duty to, to handle and to display the flag of the United States of America. Well, it's a wonderful story to hear and a very important lesson in how we do things, and especially since our Robert Arnold is honoring 
the uh, request of silence there at the train station. It's nice to be able to get your perspective on what was taking place. And as I take a look at our clock, it says 1257. This train is scheduled to depart at 1 o'clock, and I'm hoping we can put up the train route for you so you'll be able to see where this train will go, but it leaves Spring, heads in a northwesterly direction. Huffsmith will be the first stop, and we've got a reporter, Bill Spencer, stationed in Huffsmith. And so we have reporters along this route, and you'll be able to catch a glimpse of what each community is doing to express their thanks and gratitude toward our late president. Uh, Jennifer Reyna was telling me that firefighters are also standing by in these communities, and they will pitch the American flag along the route as well. So it should be a very touching image to see once engine 4141 departs uh, from Westfield train station. In addition, there are three cameras mounted on uh, this train. One that's gonna give us a forward view, a bird's eye view of the train, uh, what it sees going forward one from the back and then one from the side to catch the crowds uh, in these eight little communities uh, between here and College Station. So we'll have that, uh, that view as well, the, the onboard uh, train cameras, in addition to the cameras that we have stationed along the route and the uh, aerial cameras that we have in our Sky 2 helicopter uh, above the train route. Two hours and 25 minutes, and I'm, I'm looking on a sheet here, and it says food service, lunch. So the uh, President George W. Bush and his family will be dining on the car there as they make their way into College Station. We have our reporter stationed there as well for the ceremony that will take place. Uh, Jonathan Martinez is there, Sophia Beausoleil. As we continue our live pictures for you from the Westfield train station there, you're looking at the casket through a special rail car outfitted in plexiglass on both sides of the train. So no matter where you are along that route, people will be able to see the late president on his way to College Station. The locomotive is the first car, of course. It's 4141, uh, decked out in the colors of Air Force One. And uh, the, the train had been in storage since 2012, awaiting this very day. Uh, the president first laid eyes on it uh, back in 2005. Be, behind that is uh, another Union Pacific engine. The power uh, train is behind that, that drives the train. The crew of the train is in the fourth car. The media is in the fifth. The uh, pool reporters from the network and other places are covering this state funeral. Uh, behind it <coughs> is um, the, the uh, baggage car that we're looking at right now. That's uh, car number six, holds the president's casket. And then the three remaining cars all hold family. Bush 43 is in the car directly behind the baggage here, uh, family and friends uh, th that are going on this route are in those uh, three final cars. Security, of course, very tight along this route. There are specific instructions that, that we uh, have, uh, airspace restrictions, uh, folks on the ground, uh, the silence you see being enforced by Robert Arnold, who is there. So. Uh, all this to say that this is a very secure way to fulfill the president's final wish that he depart from his adopted hometown to his final resting place at his presidential library in College Station, some uh, 95 miles away by car, but only 70 miles by train. It's now a minute after 1 o'clock. The train is scheduled to depart at any moment now from Old Town Spring making its two hour and 25 minute, roughly, uh, trek up to College Station where another service awaits and a burial which will be private for the family and also not accessible to the media. So as with Barbara Bush's funeral, if you recall viewing that, once the hearse made its way into the gates and the gates closed, uh, that was the end. And family was granted privacy to be able to lay their loved one to rest and uh, and it's been a difficult year for the Bush family they lost their matriarch in April and the patriarch now in December and you know this would have been the first Christmas that President George H.W. Bush would have spent without his wife Barbara and they have spent Christmas together I believe for the past 71 years it was said and it just 
didn't seem right for him to have to go through a holiday season without his beloved Barbara. And so it's been said over and over that they'll be celebrating Christmas together with Robin. And it just uh, would have been a very difficult time for the president to go through a holiday. As it was, um, Dee, this was the first summer that they had not spent together at County Bunkport, Maine in over 70 years. And they, I, I think they missed, of course they missed the, uh, this, the president missed the, the time that he was um, fighting in uh, the Pacific. Um, but every other summer since then, they have always returned. And, and one of his fondest wishes uh, as um, the train begins to move here, after Barbara died, he said, I want to spend this summer at County Bunkport, mm -hmm. probably realizing that it may be his last summer. And he did that and then returned to Houston, what, in September? Came back to Houston in September. Uh, it was said that he wanted to come back to his Tex-Mex food and his sports teams, which he got to take in. It was also said that he missed holding his beloved wife's Barbara's hand. And so that longing and that loneliness, I'm sure, was palpable as the children, some of whom live here in Houston, and as those who don't, were in constant contact with their father. The uh, 4141 train now leaving the, the rail yard here. And um, we may mention the fact earlier that you, you know, if you travel from Houston to College Station by car, it takes about an hour if you're in a big hurry, an hour and a half if you're not. Mm -hmm. The train, an hour longer than that, two hours, 25 minutes. Uh, and that speed is enforced by the, by the condition of the track. Uh, we, we, uh, Union Pacific uh, has not uh, replaced or significantly improved uh, train tracks uh, in a very long time, so trains can only travel at a certain speed, probably about 35, 40 miles an hour. And one can imagine that maybe as it goes through those towns where people are standing by, it might slow down a little bit too. You see they have that, uh, what do you call the car with the dome on top, the, the observation deck. Mm -hmm. uh, so they'll be able to, to wave at folks if they want to as they go through the towns here on their way to College Station. It's a beautiful sight this rainy Thursday as the clouds moved in today for the final day of President George H.W. Bush's funeral. Weather has been it's unbelievably been spectacular. good, hasn't it? Yes. The timing just wonderful. Yes, they've been blessed, truly, as we know bad weather is moving into town tomorrow. And our weather team will be talking about that during our newscast later on today. But all in all, it has been uh, with ease and great beauty to be able to celebrate and say goodbye to our 41st president. And in Washington, where the state funeral was held uh, yesterday, they were expecting very bad weather to move in shortly after as well. So uh, on balance, the weather has just been perfect. Many people have commented on the fact that um, the president, had, if he'd planned the weather, <laughs> it would have planned it as such. <laughs> planned it exactly right. this way. I think we were, we were seeing the presidential seal on the caboose the last car of this train and the last car carrying family as you mentioned bill the last three cars carrying family and in advance of that is the casket so a slow way out of westfield train station in spring texas and a very special journey we mentioned that uh, there were four others by train president lincoln president roosevelt president kennedy and president eisenhower you know, not, not all president, a uh, president doesn't have to have a state funeral if he wishes not to. Uh, president Nixon did not have a state funeral, buried in private ceremony in California. Um, and we also mentioned that they plan the funeral while they're in office. They're required to plan it at that time. Uh, there was a department that, that helps them with the, uh, with the wishes, and I'm sure that their final touch is put on later. Uh, but the, but the bulk of the funeral that we've seen for the past funeral services that we've seen for the past week were planned uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. And all of this that we've seen has been essentially 15 years in the making. The execution the, of the, the media part of it. The has, media yes. part has been 15 years in the making to be able to provide the kind of coverage that allows the access and allows all of us to feel like we're there. I, I think that. 
These state funerals are so important for our country, Dominique, because it brings us together and makes us feel that sense of being united Americans. This is, it, it's a very patriotic, moving moment, one of those moments that we all share as, as we say farewell to a former president. And the, the pageantry involved in it all, I think, adds that patriotic, unifying effect. Here's one of the three on camera uh, views that we're going to get that we talked about earlier. It's lovely. You know, and I think to echo what you were just saying, Bill, was the visual from the state funeral in Washington where we saw all of our presidents, all of our living presidents lined up and sitting in the front row of the pew to attend the funeral. And I think that message speaks volumes. It is, you know, the great unifier to be able to bid farewell to an American president, to be able to talk about what leadership means, what service means. And of course, a big part of who George H.W. Bush was, was a friend and family. So it's been mentioned many times before, he was a great man because of what he did, but he was a good man because of who he was. We do have a guest with us today, and we're gonna ask that he uh, come into position here uh, he, he is going to help us with some of the uh, commentary as we move along here. His name is Jim Granado as he, as he joins us here on set. Jim, thank you so much for coming and being a part of this. Jim um, is uh, the executive director of the University of Houston's Hobby School of Public Affairs, professor in the UH Department of Political Science. He has a, a, a large biography here of um, of academia and work in the political field. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Tell us your takeaways from what you've been seeing and also your perspective. Starting on Friday night and talking to people, the, the reminiscences of all people that, that knew him that I know, um, he, he, the heartfelt feeling about his decency as a person mm -hmm. coupled with his monumental achievements I mean even though he was a first you know one-term president um, he was quite consequential just just the peaceful end of the Cold War was, was enough for all of us I mean not not firing a shot so just even that alone he was one of the most consequential presidents in our lifetime uh, it's been said that he, he lost his second term because of the economy and because of putting the nation first by raising taxes, yes. he, he almost sealed his own fate, but he realized that was the best thing to do for the country. That's exactly right. I mean, he called it a gut punch when, mm. when Republicans came and said, we can make a deal here. Um, the irony about that deal, even though he did raise taxes and violate that pledge, is that there's also a component of the deal dealing with pay-as-you-go, so that if you wanted to increase spending or cut taxes, you had to have a corresponding reduction somewhere else to make sure that the budget deficit didn't grow, which was the whole point of the, of the Budget Act in the first place. Mm -hmm. He also um, uh, was president when the American with Disability Act was yes. ushered in. Yes. And um, we, we were noting that yesterday when we, when we realized that when we saw Bob Dole in a wheelchair stand to salute him, and the president spent his final couple of years in a wheelchair and was disabled as well. In the Dole, the, the Dole moment at, at the, in the rotunda. It was extraordinary. Yes, in 1980, they were at each other's throats. I mean, and there was, there was a, an, on a TV show, um, Dole confronted Bush and said, stop lying about my record. I mean, they were not getting along at that point, but as, as you can see, um, they did get along later. In fact, Dole was a, you know, carried a lot of water for him when he was in the Senate. And it, it boils down to what we've been talking about as, as this funeral being a unifier, that it, it's decency and respect yes. in the end. Absolutely. That even though you have differences of opinions, you still must respect the human being. That's a, he's, he sets an example for us. I mean, even in his passing, he's doing one last service for us because in the last four or five days, the, there has, the sniping has been reduced. I mean, not where it has been. We just went through a bruising midterm. And, there's, and after that has been all this, you know, the conflagration we're all going through politically. But there has been a drop in, in our national blood pressure for at least a few days. And what do you think this will do? Sorry, I don't mean it. No, 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 no. But what do you think this is going to do? Uh, do you think this will make people sit back and reflect that, hmm, maybe we need to dial it down a notch? Is there any way to prognosticate here? That's, um, I'm not optimistic. Or I, you, I agree with you. No. I, I think it's probably not going to happen. But boy, at least we had four or five days of relative break. calm. Yes. Of relative calm because mm -hmm. it, had, it didn't all go away. No. I, you may have heard me mention the op-ed in the Chronicle, Houston Chronicle yesterday where uh, they talked about, uh, you know, 
41's not even buried yet, and yet the sniping continues, the temperature is high, yeah. right and left. Right. Um, people talking about the current administration, and this, this opinion uh, editor said, you know, can't we just keep it down until at least we've buried this man? Exactly. But, you know, it, it, it will continue, um, I'm sure, just as soon as this is over, back to the temperature it was before. Correct. I agree. Yeah, uh, sadly. We saw, and I'm not quite sure, as we are on a double box here on the left-hand side, you see a, a camera perspective from engine 4141, and then the other is the aerial shot of the uh, Sky 2 of the train moving through. And I, I saw it pass through. Look at all the cars that have come. You see everybody kind of lined up there. there. Yeah. And there was one area where I saw a fire truck, and Jennifer Reyna mentioned that the firefighters would have the American flags pitched along the uh, fire trucks there along the route. And it was just a beautiful sight to see. You know, this is this is just the heart of America right here, and the heart of Americans coming out in in the middle of their day. These people could be on lunch break um, or taking time off of work at this point just to pay their respects to the 41st president. And it is that expression of thanks and gratitude that is the the thread of civility in our society, and it's what we enjoy seeing here. That he was huge on civility. That was his main his main uh, goal for Americans to be more civil with one another. Uh, he, had, he did not uh, see that come to pass in his lifetime. No, he did not. Fortunately. Um, as Dominique was mentioning, you know, we're, we're, he'll be buried deep in the heart of Texas and right in the middle of this country. And it's, it, what we're watching here is history. Can you talk a little bit about, from the perspective of the history that we're making here today, this week? Well, we're laying to rest a, a president and a man who, when you look at his, the arc of his life, his achievements are just, there's just, there's so many. I mean, he was easily the most qualified president we've ever had. And unfortunately, he did not get reelected. But the point is, he, when he was in office, the things that he did do, we mentioned the, the, um, the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, the, the deft handling of, of, the, of, the, of the Gulf War. I mean, I mean, people who aren't living then can remember what he, we were projecting casualties of, of, of the thousands, and that war was over when the, when the fighting, the ground fight, ground war started, it was over 100 hours. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, you mentioned Disabilities Act. There's also, he did some things with the Clean Air Act. Um, there was, he started NAFTA, which I guess has a bad name now, but back then that was actually a bipartisan effort. I mean, President Clinton pushed it over the finish line. Mm -hmm. So his achievements are one thing that I think, he, again, he sets an example for all of us. The other thing I would point out is we've talked about his character, and I think you're not hearing people say, even opponents, even his opponents say good things about him. You know, that doesn't happen that often with, with, with politicians. Um, so. I mean, if you were to take a picture of Uncle Sam, maybe we should substitute George Bush's face on that from mm -hmm. now on, because he does set an example for us, I think, is just for anybody that gets into public office, you'd like to see people follow. So in terms of the history of, of him and his impact, it's been huge. And in terms of Houston, I mean, you, I don't know if you saw the, the article in the Crown by Charles Foster, who was a close mm -hmm. friend of his. He talked about just, it was just a, 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 just a, a tad of what he had done for people, but he had a Rolodex from here to San Francisco, people he knew. Um, and, and that way he could pick up the phone. And just one example, the train that's being used here by Union Pacific, Drew Lewis was the CEO of, of United, mm -hmm. um, Union Pacific. He was a Treasury a Transportation Secretary during the Reagan administration, so they were close friends. Mm -hmm. And that's how this came to pass, that Union Pacific yeah. would dial this up for him. It's fascinating. You know, you talked about some of the legislation that was passed during his time as president, and it was very much, in some cases, a moderate-type agenda. There was a lot of bipartisanship work that took place during that time. Correct. Correct. He, his, actually, Eisenhower had similar problems um, with, with his own party, and, and certainly Bush did too. I mean, there are etches in his diary where he was having trouble with um, Newt Gingrich and some of the members of the Republican, Young Turks at that time. I um, mean, he was having trouble with his own party. He got along with the speaker at the time, Tom Foley, who was a Democrat. They were friend, best friends. Mm -hmm. and they had known each other in the House. He did not get along very well with George Mitchell, who was majority leader in the Senate, but he did um, foster friendships. His, for him, the person was political. You could see it. It was just, he was able to just reach out to people and get cooperation. And one of his closest friends towards the end uh, was a Democrat, Bill Clinton. Yes. <laughs> they became famous friends as, as they raised money uh, yeah. for 
the tsunami uh, and Gulf Coast relief efforts, traveled all over the world together. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know, a lot of people don't realize it, but you know, uh, George H.W. Bush liked a glass of vodka from yes. time to time. I remember one time being at the Houstonian Hotel and uh, uh, talking with him and, a, and a, uh, a waiter came by. We were backstage before uh, he, he did his talk and he said, could you bring me a glass of vodka? So the, the young man takes off, he comes back with a cocktail-sized glass with uh, ice and vodka, and he says, no, son, I said a glass of vodka. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went back and came back later with a water glass <laughs> full, <laughs> full of vodka. And, you know, so he, all I say, that he, and the, he and Bill Clinton were, you know, found some common ground in, in the way they like to have fun and commune with one another. Mm -hmm. Called him his brother from another mother. Exactly. Yeah. That's the other thing that when they were doing their their relief work I and mean, they had, they flew plane together there was only room enough for one bed and clinton gave it to papa bush oh. yeah. uh jim granado is joining us he's the executive director of the university of houston hobby school of public affairs just hold tight with us i've got some information about uh this train specifically the engineer her name is june noblis she served nine years in the navy 16 years with Union Pacific. Hometown is Loris, South Carolina. And the conductor is Randy Kuhanek, served eight years in the Navy, 23 years with Union Pacific from New York. We just saw a, a photograph of um, firefighters standing on top of their truck saluting uh, the train as it goes by. You know, uh, you talked about the, uh, the, uh, the engineer being in, having been in the Navy. Of course, Bush 41 was in the Navy, the youngest naval aviator ever, shot down at, at the age of 20 years old. Can you imagine 20 years old driving a torpedo bomber uh, in World War II over the Pacific, and an aircraft uh, gun hits his plane. He completes his bombing run in spite of the plane being on fire, and then at the last possible moment ejects over the, the, uh, the ocean and, and is... Um, is rescued and then given the distinguished flying cross for his heroism at, all at the age of 20 he comes back to uh, comes back home uh, graduates from Yale gets married gets in the Studebaker and drives to Odessa Texas he and Barbara live in a one-room shotgun it's a double shotgun house they live on one side of it had prostitutes on the other side <laughs> Starting a new and life in Texas. Started, started the, you know, the oil, their, their oil business career here in Texas, later moved to Houston. And, and talk to us, Jim, about the public service that, that begins from a political standpoint. I mean, he was uh, envoy to China. He was a congressman. He worked, he was head of the CIA at one time. My God, it's so diverse, it's unbelievable. 40 years plus of public service. Oh, yes. His father was a senator, um, and so the first thing he really does, though, is he, start, he gets involved in Republican politics in West Texas, he moves to Houston, and the Republican Party was, was nowhere back then. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that started organizing party apparatus. But then, of course, he runs for the Senate in 1964. He loses to, to Yarborough. He then runs for Congress in 66. He wins, um, and he's reelected in 68. He then runs for the Senate again in 70, and he loses to Lloyd Benson this time. Um, and at that point, Richard Nixon encouraged him to run for the Senate in 1970, brings him on, and he becomes, I believe, chair of the Republican National Committee, which became <laughs> um, an important thing to do because uh, Watergate starts, and he's got to try and keep the party from being destroyed by that, that, that terrible event. And then he um, um, is, is envoy to China. He's, he then becomes CIA director. When Jerry Ford is looking for a running mate, this is not generally known, he picks Nelson Rockefeller, but George Bush was a finalist in that. So he could have been the VP candidate in 1976. And Jerry Ford barely lost Texas. You wonder if he would have won Texas mm -hmm. and won the election, because the election was very close. If Bush would have been his um, running mate, it well, might have Texas. made a big difference, huh? Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And then there was the Ross Perot factor. Yes, in 1992. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, that's left the dialogue a little bit, but it was a big part of having a third party in there. Right. But, yeah, he was VP. He was, after, he becomes CIA director. That was, that the agency was in terrible, you talk to folks that worked at the time, and they said he really was a, uni a unifier again. Mm -hmm. and he was extremely competent um, and, and helped resuscitate the morale of the place. Um, and a, 
spent eight years in the in the, in the White House as vice president under uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, four years as president, so 12 years uh, in, in the White House altogether. Then his sons, uh, we had two governors, and then <laughs> you know one of the governors becomes president. And let's real quick as we're looking at these beautiful images, um, just to see these crowds here All by rail the crossing. It, it's great. I mean, they're waving American flags. Um, I've seen families holding one another, people just standing by themselves, just waving, waving the American flag, fire trucks with the American flag. I mean, it's just a train route lined with Americans who are proud to wave their American flag. As the train moves uh, westbound out of Houston, but still in city limits, people, uh, you know, who live near these tracks and probably uh, uh, hate it most of the time, but not today. No, they're <laughs> loving it today. What a special and rare opportunity to witness this moment in history, to have this connection, to feel this close, to be feet away from a former president before he is laid to rest in a private ceremony with his family in College Station. It is a unique and rare opportunity, and just as President Bush would have wanted it, just as he wanted it, he created this. This, this picture looked a little bit alarming on the left side of your screen. That train on the left is stationary. It appears to be moving just because we're watching a moving train. People were on the tracks right in front of it, but it's n no alarm. So here we, here we are. Uh, what, w will they parallel 290, I guess? All the way? It, it looks like. The, yeah, the, the track is 290 is a, a northwest freeway. So it will parallel, uh, but 290 can and does probably run into other cities than the train will. And so the, the, the train route's been publicized, people knew it, and uh, they've so they've been made preparing their way for to, days. Yeah, to wherever they thought they, they've been staking it out for days now. Mm -hmm. We've been talking to people of the different towns, the officials there, and they're all sort of scratching their heads saying, boy, you know, we're going to have Ooh. more people here than we know what to do with. We've, never, we've sure. never had to confront anything like this before. That's right. And, you know, there, there's a lot of ranch land and farmland out there, and so people who are of the land are coming in to these smaller towns to be able to witness this event. And there you can see the traffic on the freeway above. Look at that. I mean, it's just spectacular to see the cars pulled aside and people lining the tracks. You know, that, that's an image from, you know, America of the early 1900s mm -hmm. when people would line train tracks. And it's just not a sight that you see anymore. And this really is a throwback to the days of old. Folks wanted to be a part of history, and history is being made here. I'm going to talk to our producer. Daniel, can you, any idea of the next town that we're approaching? Probably going to go through Hempstead and then on to Huffsmith. The problem in Huffsmith, we have a reporter there, but we haven't been able to tighten up his signal enough to get to him yet. Well, hopefully, that hopefully by the time the train gets there, yeah. that will be uh, resolved. We've got somebody in Navasota as well and in Magnolia. In Magnolia. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll um, be visiting with them just as soon as they're, we can get the, the signal uh, to work. A lot of technology involved in covering a, a funeral today, <laughs> as opposed to, but you get so much more. Well, and, and frankly, we were talking about the weather. I'm giving thanks that it's not raining out there today hard because, you know, we are, we have this because of our chopper shot. This is what gives you the perspective. And so we are very grateful that Sky 2 is able to capture this and is not uh, grounded due to weather, which, you know, will happen tomorrow. And the side mount camera on board the train, train. itself that's showing us the left part of the screen here folks standing uh, on the uh, on the tracks that go the other direction waving at the train as it goes by it's a beautiful sight and our chopper to the right and the train as you said the first uh, town will be Huffsmith but still there are many many areas where we're seeing crowds gather not it doesn't have to be these uh, Texas towns it's just anywhere along the route and anywhere close to where these folks live and a lot of people driving in from the cities and they're just finding a space because they know some of these towns will be heavily populated because of this special and, and remarkable event. And that's true, people. We, we did a story on one person who uh, traveled a thousand miles uh, to be part of history, to see uh, this happen. Uh, we had that nice email yesterday from a former congressman mm -hmm. uh, town. from Ohio who uh, has moved to Texas and came here because he was invited uh, to the funeral. He, he had, he had uh, uh, served during the same time that uh, 41 was in the White House and knew the president and 
he, uh, he and his wife got an invitation and came here to Houston to, uh, to attend it. All kinds of notables, dignitaries, famous people. We had uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger talking. Uh, it was really spectacular to see the turnout at St. Martin's Church today and, and just a beautiful service, um, quite uplifting, quite a celebration of his life. His grandson, the eldest grandson, George P. Bush, talked about his favorite food, barbecue, tacos, <laughs> ice cream. I found out that Chinese he liked food. Klondike bars. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's great, these anecdotal stories. And then there was that really sweet story of how, how 41 would say uh, the kids would get a first to sleep award, which is genius. When you have that many grandkids and you need quiet in the house, you set up some sort of a system and a, and a game to get everybody into bed. But it was wonderful, this, this insight into the personal family life. And as we've been talking to Jim Granado, who's with the U of H Hobby School of Public Affairs, we've been talking about his public service, but equally as important is his private service. Sure. Just got an email from somebody who's who's watching the uh, the train go by. Uh, it said they're currently parallel to 99 near Gosling Road, so fo folks are 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 um, watching uh, the coverage, I guess, on their cell phones and listening to us talk and letting us know uh, where they are along the route here. The, again, technology, right? Okay. It's crazy. Real time. Yeah, in, in real time. Look, look at the, the crowd here on the right side yeah. of your screen. Who are wait, who, I don't think the trains come through just yet. No, but, but there's the another fire that's truck. That's our helicopter shot. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, so there are fire trucks that are, that are stationed all along. This, this has to be sort of a nightmare for the Secret Service because they like to secure routes in advance, but when you, you know, you're trying to secure a 70-mile stretch of country. Sure, when anybody could pop along a rail, a rail track, and that's what's happening. People are just finding their opportunity to get in and pay their respects. And we've seen clusters of Texans and clusters of American flags. So it's a beautiful tribute and, and send off to a president who made it known that he was a president of the people, that he connected with the people. We've been talking this past week about how many people have a photograph with the 41st president. He was that accessible and that approachable. He was always out and about whenever he was here in Houston. We talked about how he ate at his favorite restaurants, attended his favorite sporting games. He was never secluded in any way, always real and approachable, let everybody take a picture with him, made everyone feel special in the process. And so it makes sense that we see this type of public outpouring of love and affection for a man who turned nobody down. And, you know, most people who came into contact with this president, even in a very peripheral way, I'd say at a, uh, working at a restaurant, not necessarily uh, a significant meeting, got a note from the president. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect that he probably had somebody on his staff who, who, who uh, wrote most, most of these notes at, at his direction. That he direction probably dictated. That, and, and then that he signed mm -hmm. and sent. But mm -hmm. what, 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 do, what do you think that's about, Jim uh, Granado, about all these notes and all these photographs? He's building a legacy in, in, in a way, is he not? Friendship mattered to him, obviously, and he just, he, he just liked people, which made him a very important public figure. I mean, you have to like people, be successful, and he just, he just built these relationships. And what you're seeing here and uh, today, but in the last four or five days, it can't be faked. We liked this man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's in that example you just brought up about the notes, that's just one thing, but he was, he was forever helping people. From, I mean, I have colleagues at, at the Bush School at Texas A&M, and they, they talked about when people would come into their apartment for a party, the Bushes would serve them, serve them the drinks. Yeah. I mean, it's just, just that kind of you know, servant leadership. Is and just having come from special. such a patrician background yes. to, to to, to the life of humility and service that they had. I, I read that uh, in the inauguration, Barbara wore shoes that she bought for $26. <laughs> I bet they were comfortable. And, you know, I mean, they just weren't pretentious people. That's right. You know, they... Uh, she made a joke during when she, they were first elected, you'll be seeing pearls. Uh -huh. Fake, I mean, they were like, they were Fake not books. expensive. Sure. No, right. not at all. Right, exactly. And, and that's what made her so endearing yeah. because she was touchable, relatable, yeah. and people could be like her. Yeah. Yeah. People could be like her. She always said she didn't like her neck, and that's why she wore her pearls. But it became such a beautiful statement and a symbol of her class and elegance. 
and, uh, and even more so was just witnessing this phenomenal love affair between yes. two people. You know, a couple married for as long as they were is a rarity these days. And then to see the level of love, admiration, and respect that they had for one another also set that bar even higher. Dominique, we're going to visit with uh, Brittany Jeffers, who is in one of the towns along the train route here. She's in Magnolia. Of course, the train's not there yet, but people are. Brittany, what are you, what are you seeing there? Yeah, Bill, people have been here since before dawn this morning. I heard somebody describe this as the heart of the city. Uh, they're here near the historic depot on both sides of the tracks. If you take a look, they've got their lawn chairs, their flags, their umbrellas because it was drizzly this morning. So many of them saying that they wanted to be here to experience history, to have the opportunity to pay their respects to the 41st president. Talked with people from all over, people who've traveled here from New Caney, from Bowen, from College Station, uh, someone from Georgia even who said that he took his kids out of school for a few days so that they could make a road trip just to be here. Um, also, people who are local. I'm here with a veteran right now, uh, Mr. Jim Carroll, is it? Uh, sir, why did you want to be here uh, today? Well, President Bush was a veteran. I'm a veteran, and I just had to show my respect for him. As, as a veteran and as our president. And thank you for your service as well, sir. Um, uh, we were here early this morning. Uh, other people were here even before us, before the sun came up. What did you think of this, uh, to be here in your town, to see so many people here who want uh, to, to give a tribute? This is remarkable. I didn't know that there was that many people in Magnolia. <laughs> <laughs> there is literally thousands of people here. And, and I thank them, each and every one of them, for being here. Uh, for those, uh, I, I was trying to explain, uh, the, you can see up and down the tracks here, the, the flags and, and people sitting and just the camaraderie, uh, it, kind of a unified front here. How would you describe all of the, the people and, and sort of the feeling here right now? It's, it's a feeling of u unity. Uh, something that uh, President Bush pushed for, being friendly, being, uh, a, being one, being a country, and being together. Love it. You said that very well, sir. Thank you again. I Thank so you. appreciate it. Uh, again, people are here just waiting anxiously for 4141 to arrive. Uh, we are going to be waiting uh, as well. Montgomery Police Department has, was out here pushing people back uh, and reminding them the safety measures as staying about 25 feet from the tracks as we wait. So we will be out here. We'll keep checking in with you. The train anticipated to be here shortly. And we will, we will rejoin you when it comes through. And just for your information, it's just about to Hopsmith. So that's about two towns away from you. So we'll get back with you, Brittany Jeffers.